So this is, um, this is some ideas that uh, Chris Matz and I have been kicking around for a while. Chris Matz is, um, comes from the business analysis side. Um, so I'm not entirely sure how this is going to go. It turns out there is presentation debt as well as technical debt. Uh, plus, I'm in the middle of changing my glasses for description. But let, let, let's see how this runs. Um, so many of us struggle uh, to get the point across because we, we, we look at this horrible code or horrible system that we're, we're dealing with. And we struggle to get the point across to non-technical people as to why this matters. Um, and you know they're going, ship, ship, ship. And we're going, no, 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 we can't ship. Um, and the trouble is, although we know what's right, that makes us look like these special interest moaners who don't understand the business, don't understand the realities of business and the real issues. So that's the sort of premise. First, a couple of clarifications. So I know we keep repeating this, and some it doesn't always get through, which is technical debt is not really about bad code. Um, that's just bad code. Um, and if you don't believe me, you can believe Walt Cunningham, who invented the term. So this is a long quote. Um, he, he actually recorded a little video that explained it. So I'm never in favor of writing code poorly, but I'm in favor of writing code to reflect your current understanding of a problem even if that understanding is partial, part two. In other words, the whole debt metaphor, let's say, the ability to pay back debt and make the debt metaphor work for your advantage depends on, upon your writing code that is clean enough to be able to refactor as you come to understand your problem. Right, so this is not, you know, 1,000 line switch statements and 20,000 line methods and the rest of it. This is not about that kind of problem. Um, but another explanation of this is technical debt as a lack of um, habilita habita habitability. It's going to be a long day. Um, <laughs> this is a term from Dick Gabriel. And it's a sense of a code where you, you know where stuff is and you don't have to think about it because it's in the right place. And the way of thinking about this is if you think about, you know, you're in the kitchen making a cup of tea. And on the whole, if it's your kitchen, people don't move things. Um, you know where to find the spoons and the tea bags and the, and the the mug and the kettle and all that kind of stuff. Um, now, I've only heard one story about code that was actually like this. As a colleague of mine was working at a place, and they got dropped on this project that was late and said, look, go and spend three days with it. And he said, oh, really? So he went and sat there, and he thought, well, if, here's a task. And if I'm going to do this, I'm going to need one of these. Oh, there it is. And I'll need to plug it into one of these. Oh, there it is. And the whole thing went on like this. And it says it was the most fantastically productive code base uh, that he'd ever worked in. Now, the backstory is the way that they achieved that is there was one guy who was a total maniac. And every time you tried to create a type and name it, he would sit on your head until it was perfect. Um, so everybody hated him. Um, <laughs> but they had the code base. Um, and so in this, these terms, the sort of kitchen terms, technical debt is more about suddenly discovering that you need a fish kettle because you've got guests coming around rather than suddenly discovering that the milk is in the oven. So you get the drift. And one of the things this says is that technical debt is a socio-technical problem, a uh, technical phenomenon, rather, um, because hab habitability involves both the thing, the code, if you like, or the system, and the people who are working with it. Um, and if you think about it, we've all, or most of us, I imagine, have learned to read the modern kitchen. You know, you can probably work, work, wander into a fitted kitchen anywhere in the world and figure out how to make a cup of tea. Um, if, if we were brought up as nomads, not used to this, it would be a much harder step for us. Um, so imagine, I mean, as a case study, if you imagine that uh, a thought experiment, if you, met, you had this excellent code base and you had all the shiny patterns in it and you'd all the functional goodness, and then something happens organizationally and this code base gets handed off to a team that has no, no idea of what's going on or has no, is not used to this, that could be more thing, uh, then all of a sudden this code base is not habitable. They don't know where, how to make this work. Is that... Have you suddenly just introduced debt? That's, that's why the, it's not just, it's a socio-technical uh, phenomenon. And the reason we care about technical debt is because it introduces uncertainty. Um, when the model in the code doesn't match the world you're trying to, to build to, uh, we have to work much harder to, to bridge the two. And that either means surprising refactorings that suddenly turn up and get in the way, or bugs or whatever, 
or he would end up writing ugly, brit ugly brittle code to bridge the to bridge the uh, to make the connection, um, which you then have to deal with and understand every time you touch it. And all of this makes it harder for people, for us to predict what's going to happen, even at a short scale, which makes it harder for the people who depend on us to break promises that, that can be kept. And I think there's another level of uncertainty, which is the team demotivation. Because we all know that if you spend your entire day dealing in a code base that's just ugly and, or not right, should we say, not appropriate, and there's no prospect for doing anything about it, it's very hard to stay sort of on the ball and focused, enthusiastic. Um, and eventually your good people will leave and your quality drops and you go into the death spiral. So the common way of talking about it, which again goes all the way back to the, the original formulation, is that technical debt is it's like a credit card. I mean, that's the original metaphor. It's like a credit card. You take out loan, I borrow you know, 100 quid, and then I get interest payments, you know, whatever it is, 12% a month, whatever, whatever your card is charging, um, and it all compounds up, um, and you get principal plus interest. And you know, eventually, if you don't pay your bills off, the compound interest goes through the roof, and you go bankrupt, or your code goes bankrupt. And it turns out that you can hire consultancies that will price your technical debt down to two decimal places, <laughs> which I'm quite impressed with. Um, but there's a problem with this model, which is imagine you have a couple of components. Um, there's a red component and a green component. And the red component is full of debt. It's just horrible. Um, and the green component is not, you know, it's not great, but it's not, it's, not, it's not quite that bad. If you approach things in terms of looking at where the biggest debt is, you'd look at the red component. However, what we also know is that the red component never changes. It's not, never changed in the past. It's not going to change in the future. At least we're not going to change it. Whereas the green component is it's in the middle of flux. You know, it's in the middle of the heart of what's going on. And that changes all the time. If we prioritized in terms of debt driven, you know, what's the quality of the code, we would be fixing the red component to no benefit whatsoever. Where we should be looking at the green component and cleaning it up even further. Um, and what you find is, is that there are parts of your system where you just, the best thing to do is cover it in concrete and not touch it. Um, you got one of those? Nobody? Yeah, right. Um, and actually, for me, a lot of open source software comes in this category. <laughs> there are large frameworks which remain nameless. It doesn't really matter. They're all, you know, every time you, you've, in the, the, the open source frameworks, you crack them open, you go, oh, no, I don't want to look at that. But they work, because so many people have used them, so it's fine. You know, just, just, it's, not, it's not up to us to fix them. Um, for a while, I, I used to use Chernobyl as the metaphor for this, but then it sort of, that felt a bit off. Except if you think about it, it is the perfect example of technical debt. They had a problem they had to fix, like, right now. So they dropped lots of concrete on it and sort of stopped, stopped the, well, literally stopped the bleeding. Um, and now, I don't know if you've seen, they've, they've built this enormous, shed over the top of it at enormous expense so they can dismantle it cleanly. Um, but, you know, we, we generally, I hope, don't get to deal with situations like that, but it's, it's sort of perhaps the, the perfect example. Anyway, what this says is that technical debt is a product owner issue. Um, the whole point of technical debt is to balance long-term and short-term priorities. Um, and if the product owners delegate decisions about such trade-offs to technical stories uh, without necessarily understanding the value of why you want, might want to do that, then, well, part of it is they're not doing their job because their job is to prioritize. Um, and they're not necessarily making the best possible decisions because a significant part of their budget is out of their control. Um, on the other hand, if the product owner is ignoring all this stuff and driving the code into a ditch, they're also not doing their job. So that's, you know, it's, not, you know, it's not uninformed uh, decision-making prioritization. And for us, the risk is that if, te if technical debt is just a technical issue, it's just those geeks, then we will always lose because we will always lose out to the business because it's just the noise they're just being prima donnas again. Uh, you know, they shouldn't be worrying about that. Um, 
And the other thing, going back to the principal and interest problem, is the other problem that we have is, in my experience, technical data is not, is not linear. So again, we, we're casting technical issues or whatever, um, technical issues in financial terms to try and make them matter to product owners and business sponsors. And the thing with the principal versus it plus interest metaphor, or this compound interest, is it sounds kind of linear. It, it sounds pretty straightforward. Um, and this is what a lot of the, how, the way a lot of people talk about technical debt. Uh, and, and again, it suggests two things. One, it suggests that debt is a function of the code, not the code in context. And that means that uh, all debt is equal, which means, again, it's just a matter for the development team. But the other side of this is that for a lot of people on the management side, debt is just a tool. It signals to the business people that all this stuff that we're moaning about um, is safe and easy to control. Because you know, if you're doing investment and you, you, know, you put some money into something and you look at the, what's it, the net present value and all that kind of stuff, if you're dealing with that every day, debt is a useful tool and I'll have some more of that. Technical debt, great, carry on. Um, which is not the message we want to get across. Um, and in my experience, um, technical debt is, can be very dynamic. Um, it can suddenly blow up in your face when you're not expecting it. And if you're unlucky, it can have a huge effect on the team's ability to deliver. Um, which is why, when you're talking about it, there has to be some notion of tying it to product concerns. So Chris came up with this um, alternative metaphor, uh, which we sort of argued around a bit. Um, can we think of another way of explaining how things are work? that will attract the right kind of attention. Um, now, I want to point out that this is a metaphor, not load-bearing. It's not a financial model. One of the problems you see with technical debt is people going away trying to, trying to do calculations on it. And it's really, it's just intended to get the point across to people who don't necessarily understand the detail of what we're doing. And there's some qualities we'd like to get from this uh, metaphor. We'd like to talk, be able to talk about the value of technical debt, technical debt has its place and it's sort of, you know, it has positive and negative connotations. So we'd like to be able to talk about the value as well as, well as the cost of incurring technical debt. Um, it needs to reflect the dynamic nature because as requirements and things change, debt, technical debt actually changes meaning, at least for subcomponents. Um, we should really recognize that, a value, uh, a, that as the value of change increases, the value of the debt goes down. There's an inverse relationship there. Um, we want to get to a point where we pro uh, product owners will actually prioritize cleanup over, uh, over new features. Um, and that means we have to encourage the product owner to own the technical debt as something that they care about. And then finally, which is kind of, it's all kind of related, is to encourage product owners to think about which components are relevant. Um, because again, not all technical debt is actually equal. So first, a little terminology. How many people are familiar with cost of change? Or, sorry, with cost of delay? There's a handful of terms, right? So in the sort of agile analysis world, this is a big thing, the lean sort of thing. Uh, comes from Don Reinertsen in this formulation. So imagine you've got this change that you want to make. And if you do it, in a month's time, it's worth 10 million quid. Um, if it takes two months to do, then you've lost a month in the middle, and that means it's only worth six million quid. So your cost of delay, four million quid. Um, and again, I, it's surpri you know, it continues to astonish me how many organizations don't think about the cost of waiting, for, uh, waiting to achieve something. So imagine you have a team, and they're chugging along nicely. Uh, they're delivering mythical units of change. Um, which will produce value for them. Um, and it turns, because of the value and because of the thing, each mythical unit of change um, has a cost of delay. If you take another month to deliver it, you lose so much money in the process. So that's the value of the, the, the that's the cost of delay. And the team is sort of, well, we can do, oh, you can't see that on the bottom. So we've done, done one thing, that's good. Um, and this is kind of how fast the team can go with the current code base. And, oh, hey, we can do two, that's good. There's a demand for two things. Now we want three units of change. Okay, we can do that. But the problem is we've just hit the team capacity. 
So with the current code base, this is as fast as we can go. Now, so far, that's not a problem because there hasn't been any extra demand. Uh, but now, you know, the marketing people have done their work and, oh, this is other feature we'd really like to build, but we can't because we can't go any faster. And now there's another feature we'd like to build and you can start to see the cost of delay uh, growing. And this is the value of reducing the technical debt because if we could go faster, then we could get all this stuff done and it would be worth lots and lots. You see, it's highly, highly technical terminology here. Um, so, as, so the basic point is, as demand rises um, and we can't cope with it, the cost, of, uh, the cost of delay increases too. And fixing things becomes more and more valuable. Now, this is where it gets a bit finance in the city. Um, it turns out this looks just like a call option. How many people, I would expect in this room, actually understand or have heard of financial options? Yeah, I expect it good, but there's quite a high proportion of not. So I'm going to try and explain this. If you, if you know what I'm talking about, just, just hold your breath. I know there's a few people that do this for a living. Um, so an option says, I bought the right, but not the obligation for something to happen in the future. And in this case, we bought the right, but not the obligation to buy an asset at an agreed price, a price we agree now, at some point in the future. And if you think this is all very exotic, think about hotel bookings. So you make your reservation, and quite often with hotels, if you cancel within a certain amount of time, uh, close to the booking, then you lose 10% or 50% or whatever of your uh, reservation fee. So if you think of it, that's a, you bought an option on a hotel room. Um, if you cancel, you lose the premium, which is the 10%, um, but you don't have to buy the hotel room. Um, and so, again, this is the sort of thing where you've, you've, you've agreed the price. If, when the time comes to actually make the purchase, um, if the real price is lower, then fine, you just forget about the whole thing. Everybody goes home. If the real price is higher, they have to supply you this thing, which is now more expensive, at the price you've agreed, that you agreed when you bought the option. And there's a whole tower of stuff you can do about this. Um, now, what happens as the pressure increases? Let's look at this from the other side. So here we are, pottering along, um, carrying our technical debt. For the first three, it's OK. Um, but then you start to see, as, as the demand increases and we can't supply it, that the value of the carrying the technical debt drops. And we're now losing lots and lots of money. Um, in, in effect, the graph flip, flips over. And in the financial world, this is called a, a short call option. I've sold a call option. I've sold the right to somebody else. I've, given, I've sold somebody else the right to call me up in the future, at a point in the future, and ask me for the, to sell them this asset at a strike price that we've agreed today. And you'll notice one of the things, one of the reasons people don't like this is because it goes down. And there's no bottom to it. And the reason this matters is if you talk to people that are familiar with these concepts, you don't do this. It's a big no-no. Um, and at our level, the level most of us are dealing with, and probably maybe a couple of people immediately above us, uh, when you talk about a sole call option, uh, you really don't know what you're talking about. But as you go up the hierarchy and people get more and more financial, uh, they will come, they're used to dealing with some of these concepts. And if you start telling them you, you sold a call option, they will get very jumpy and start to pay a lot more attention to the stuff that's going on on your project, which may or may not be a good thing. Um, and to bring it back to the hotel metaphor, if you imagine that the hotel, when, you know, I mean, this is like, it's like um, uh, airplane overloading, what I call it. The hotel sells you know, options on all its rooms many times over. And then most of the time it works out because lots of people cancel. And then it turns out that, um, one time, you know, there's a convention or a football match and nobody cancels. And there's no, ho you haven't got any hotel rooms. All your neighboring hotels haven't got any rooms, you know. And by the way, there are penalties for, for having sold this and not being able to deliver. Then you end up with one of these. And this is a, to me, this is a, this concept is a way of describing the dynamic nature of technical debt, which is you're pottering along nicely and then suddenly it goes really bad. Um, so this is Chris's formulation. 
I have a slightly different one, which is very similar, which if you think about um, every time I write a, a little code shortcut, uh, you know, I take a shortcut in the code that I don't really make it quite as clean as it should be. Um, effectively, I've sold a call option. Um, I've collected the premium, thank you very much, because we've shipped to production or whatever, and the, whatever it is, whatever it is that's supposed to happen is we look great, you know, we've done our, shipped the feature, we collected our value, um, but we've also sold a promise. Uh, because the Agile only, or the X, well, certainly for me, XP, but Agile only works if you can go where you need to go when the time comes. Um, and if you think of a code base, there's lots and lots of these little decisions. Like the whole thing is this big portfolio. Quite a lot of the time, it's fine. You can just get away with it. Um, you might lose a few corners, but you know, none of it is very big. It lar involves large amounts of value. Um, so actually, it's not a bad way of progressing for quite a long time. And then they, one day, they walk in and say, by the way, we, we, want, we, we want to open in five countries as soon as possible. And you go, oh, we didn't think of that, did we? And we've got lots and lots of sold call options all over the code base. And they've all been called, called at once. It's like a shift in the market. And to me, that's, that's, that's the way I look at it. Um, and then, yeah, down you go. So if we go back through our things, you see, we, I, I hope we covered most of these. See, I put ticks up, so we, they are covered. Um, Value and cost, um, relating cost to the value of change, uh, trying to prioritize, I mean, the, some of the cleanup stuff will come, come to in a minute, but trying to attack attention, make people think about technical debt in a sort of more sophisticated way. Um, and then it, but also it encourages this thinking about this dynamic nature of debt. It's not flat, it's not a principal and interest model. It kind of depends where you're going at the time. Um, and that a sudden change in requirements can take you in a direction you never thought you were going to go. Um, so that says, well, what do you do about this debt? Um, what, I mean, how, how, do you, how do you think about what you're going to do about it? So one is it makes cost of delay for upcoming features much more important than a lot of organizations should, should be. Uh, like I say, I, I continue to be surprised by organizations, business side organizations that don't understand this. I uh, remember many, many years ago, one of my very early XP projects, um, the product manager, that was product manager in those days, came up and said, oh, you have to fix this really quickly because we're losing customers every day and it's gonna be dreadful. Oh, you mean there's more money for kit? No, 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 it's not what I meant at all. You know, they, 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 the money only seems to work in one direction. Um, it makes you think about reduction in lead time because if you, Reduce your lead time, cost of delay goes down because you can do more. Um, and also probably thinking about, you know, trying not to let uh, bugs go out and leak out into production because again, every time you do that, it's effectively extending your cost of delay but beyond where you thought it was. And what this says, if you're gonna talk about this, um, it takes a degree of sophistication on the product side, product owner side, and open discussion, or actually on both sides, to be able to discuss these things openly. And it also takes a degree of reflection and being able to measure the current state so that you can start to make some sensible decisions. So, this really is going faster than I thought. What do we tell the product owners? Because um, they're going, well, that's okay, I can see that's being really important. Um, what do we do? Um, and there are some sta standard strategies that everyone in this room should al already know. There's things like, cleaning up an area when you go to make a change. What's the best prediction of the next bit that you need to clean up, you know, where, where the change is gonna be, it's where the change, the, you know, where you just made a change. So while you're in there, give it a good going over. And what I generally find is that when you take a bit, bit of code that you're already in, and you clean it up a bit, is it reveals a whole bunch of latent failures that, um, or relate, latent bugs that either you hadn't spotted or were, hadn't quite happened yet. Um, and then there's other things like, if you want to go faster, there's the code, but there's also the development environment and the culture that you can fix. You know, simple things like, um, uh, it, it, makes it, in the, it makes it in much more in the product owner's interest to lobby for improvements to the development environment. So another colleague of mine at a large institution not very far from here um, measured his hourglass time 
not lost productivity, just raw time watching the hourglass. And even with the bloated internal charging costs for a new machine, he worked out it would take three months to pay for of his day rate to pay for a new machine because it was so slow. And of course, took to the manager, and the manager says, "Great, what am I supposed to do with this?" Um, but if you're in the kind of company where you can do something about it, that's the sort of thing that that uh, you can you can. In it's the sort of uh, thing to reflect on as to, to, to get the lead time down. But there's a, also a sort of risk-based, shall we say, risk-based approach to prioritization. If you want to think about, this is a hurricane map, uh, which unfortunately we appear, looks like we're going to see a lot more of. Um, and the, the, th the feature about hurricane maps is you have this cone of uncertainty. So we pretty much know where it is today. Um, we have a what is it? Reasonable chance of where it's going to be sort of in 24 hours and, you know, gradually the, the, as time goes out, the, the cone widens, possibly quite a long way. Um, and, you know, sometimes three or four days out is, is a, a distance, is, is a range of several hundred miles. Um, but the thing is, it does give us a couple of things. It gives us a general direction. Um, and if we've done our homework, we will be familiar with the coastline. Uh, you know, we will have sort of done the work on, on figuring out where are the weak spots on the coastline and all the kind of, maybe not in practice, but in theory, we should know where the weak spots are um, and where we should most pay attention and be most responsive uh, if, think, if the hurricane heads in that direction. And then, of course, the, the map itself is continuously updated as the hurricane moves. Um, so, I know, and certainly in the early days of Agile, we used to pitch this thing about we could go wherever you want to go. We could turn this payroll, you know, give us enough time, we can refactor it into a, a billing, you know, into an airline billing system or something, ticketing system. But in practice, most, most organizations don't operate like that. Uh, maybe in the lean startup pivotal world, sort of, maybe you would. But for most of us, there is a bit of a roadmap. You kind of know where you're going. Um, and a lot of organizations, actually, there's not much room, room to maneuver anyway. So, we can start to think about things like maybe a hurricane product hur hurricane map. So just to walk this through, imagine this is your backlog. Is it immediate to same color scheme. This is immediate to far away. Uh, and across here, we've got a number of components. Um, and these ticks are where, when we have to do this, we have to fix this component. Maybe we have to go into this component. And it's not, it shouldn't be that hard to have that sort of rough analysis. And then across the top is this technical debt, which again, you know, maybe some degree of rough analysis or guesswork or something, which is if we're going to clean this up, it's going to take us 20 days, 500 days, two days, 100, whatever. Um, and you can start to see kind of where you're going and where the danger spots are. And the interesting thing is if you were to do a raw code analysis of where the, the biggest problem was. Bank is 500 days to clean up. That's obviously where we start. Except, it doesn't look like we're going to touch it at any point in the foreseeable future. So that would make it a terrible place to start. Whereas, Chesham, um, it's coming up soon and we're going to touch it again. And although it's only two points, um, maybe we should just fix it and clean it up while we're in there because it's not a big deal and we can go a little bit faster and it'll be one less thing to worry about. And we'll see that Allgate and Farringdon are, they're coming up soon, it's not a big deal. I mean, they're not, they're okay, they're not dreadful, but you know, we could do a bit in there. But particularly Allgate, we've got, we've got two coming up, so we maybe want to be a bit more thorough when we touch this one. And then we can see right down here, there's a Debden, not sure which line that's on, I forget. Um, that's coming up, and that's 100 days of, of cleanup, or 100 points of cleanup. Um, we really don't want to address that when we get here, because everything will grind to a halt. But what we could do is start shedding in, in a, a bit of work to sort of chip away at it, so that by the time we get here, the problem is a lot lower. And if it turns out we don't get here, well, we haven't spent too much on it. It's probably a good idea anyway, because it'll come back. So you can kind of see how thinking about the, the remote distance and mapping it to the most relevant components or the most relevant parts of the system, whatever it is, um, is a way of 
helping people think about what's important. Um, and the other thing is you can do this with another way of coping with, with crises, is, which is certainly the original scrum formation, um, formulation, was if you have a problem, everyone mobs onto it. You know, everyone sort of jumps on the problem. Um, and if you think about it, you could do this for uh, team members as well. You can sort of the team skills mat uh, matri matrix. So you could look at, well, we've only got one person that knows how to do mobile, and we've got a lot of mobile coming up. So maybe we could cross-train a couple of people, so at least they could cope. You know, at least they could fix a few bugs or something. Um, and in fact, paying down technical debt is quite a good place to do a bit of cross-training, because you know you've got the stuff there. All you have to do is learn how to. Um, it's about fixing stuff that's already there rather than starting from scratch, which is often the most hard, the, the hardest thing. Now, Chris calls this staff liquidity, which is a, team, a term that I hate, but uh, he seems to like it. Um, but it's a similar sort of point, which is a little bit of look ahead, a little bit of figuring out where the risks are and where the, uh, where the potential bottlenecks are, and a little bit of prep to take in that direction. So just to wrap up, and I told you this, wasn't, this was going to be an interesting one. Um, you have to remember it's just a metaphor. Um, the point is, to come, is not to come up with this sort of scientific method that you can go and go out and run your black shoals over your code base and come up with a perfect price and the number here you are. Your, your code is now worth, you know, it, you need to spend £3.63 on every line of code to fix it. Um, the point is it's a way of looking at the team, way of looking at the system and the, together, uh, where it is and where it's going. Uh, and especially, it's the point about, it's about getting the point across to people in other worlds who have other vocabularies um, so that you can attract the attention deserve and get the right, the, 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 the problem deserves. Um, and to, to the extent that you can, is make the best choices today. And that's finished rather early. So I think that opens up the floor. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Uh, one at the back. Uh, oh, sorry. I think you meant the one with the mic, sorry. But what do you want to do? I think up. there was one at the back, and then I'll come around with the microphone. Yeah. Right. Uh, really interesting. I'm not a dev, so I don't want to get lynched. But um, I, I think it's interesting to have a unit of expression for time with the product concern. A lot of times, uh, it can be tech debt is expressed to the product owners in story points. So your hurricane map of the um, product hurricane map, that probably can do with a dimension of cost of delay, because it's currently two dimensional, and which is what happens. Sorry, what was the third dimension? Uh, cost of delay. Cost Sorry. of delay, oh. Um, well, the cost of delay is kind of, maybe so. Because what, what, yeah. what it tells is, it. It talks about each of those efforts and yeah. uh, how, how, many, how many days or points it's going to take yeah. and the sequence of work. But if you superimpose cost of delay and you actually let the product owner form the whole product hurricane map in that mm. sense, which is what we tend to fail on most occasions. We, yeah. we as tech teams don't help product owners to form that. Rather, we present this uh, two-dimensional thing to product owners. Yeah, it could be. I'm not... The cost of delay would be on the backlog items, I guess. And the idea is, is to, to burn it down. But anyway, yeah, it'd be interesting to see if you put so much effort in, how much do you think the cost of delay would go down? Sure. And w would you qualify that as a good technical debt to have? So if something unlocks value, but you knowingly accrue some tech debt? Well, the, the whole point about tech, so again, just to finish this one up, the whole point about the metaphor, the original metaphor is, <laughs> I can take short-term decisions. I, c I can balance the short-term and the long-term uh, with, hopefully, with full consciousness uh, rather than I'm just going to jam this in and hope for the best or I'm going to do this perfect, you know, whatever thing regardless of the consequences. And the, the whole idea is to balance <coughs> a tooling, a, a, a way of talking about that balance, perhaps, and putting it stronger than that. 
Hi there. Um, Hi. I have a question about how tech debt can be brought up earlier in the design process. Mm. So uh, for, for myself, and a lot of my experience, um, tech debt is identified really early during whiteboarding sessions. Like these are two possible paths that mm. we can take. Uh, and, and it's not necessarily something that you always, it's like a shortcut that you're, while you're programming, that yeah. you, you decide to take. So I was wondering if you had any strategies on like how, w when you identify it early, how can you um, come up, well, achieve the results of like transferring it to the product owner at that point, uh, if, if before you start the implementation, I guess. I suppose, it, I mean, it depends on the, si on the scale of it. I mean, if it's small, then the right answer is just fix it and stop arguing and don't even tell anyone. Because okay. it's, it's, it's kind of <laughs> like it gets lost in the soup kind of thing. Um, I mean, small, I mean small. Um, I mean, a lot of this stuff is really about, it's big enough for someone to notice. You know, it's like this, oh, we, we are just about to do this and we know we suddenly discover we have to swap out the database. Or example of your choice. Um, so I guess, I think what, what, particularly what Chris is trying to say is, is if you ca cast these discussions in terms of, well, we can do this, but before we can do this, it's going to take six weeks of conversion or fix up or whatever, uh, then they can start to make decisions. And it's about raising it in the right terminology rather than, um, oh, it's just dreadful. You, know. <laughs> it's, you have to give them something they can, they can, they can, pri they, they can um, Prioritize against, and then you have to have the right kind of team where you can actually have a meaningful discussion, rather than you know shut up and type. Thanks. I think there's feathers here. Hi. Yeah, the um, hurricane maps look great. It also reminds me of something done by a guy named Colin Brecht at it's Tesla. Yeah. Okay, something called quality views, yeah. and the idea is that essentially you just have a picture of the architecture. It turns out the lines don't matter so much as much as the subject areas, the components and color the components based mm. upon the readiness for change. Yeah. And the interesting thing with this, though, is essentially without going and saying, this is the list of the features and the times that we actually expect you to do these things, you just basically have that on the board as you're making feature decisions. And then when estimates come up, you can say, well, yeah, you kind of see that thing over there is a bit orange, and that's impacted by this feature. And then you can kind of go back and forth. It seems like the longer term benefit of this is product people can actually see the colors change over time. Mm. And you can maintain history of that and go and say, look, you know, so we decided to go and do this thing a bit early, and that cost us to go and actually go a little bit in debt over here as opposed to that. And it's fascinating that without having a conversation about technical debt at all, essentially people start going and asking the question. They start saying, oh, gee, you know, that thing's been orange for a while. What do we do to make that yellow so things are a bit better? So yeah. it's kind of an interesting thing to go and kind of, it seems like with the visual, we can sidestep the entire language of technical debt a bit well, I hope and so. just I mean, make it visceral. You know? Yeah, I mean, that's the, the danger of the, the current metaphor. And, and the thing about it is, I think the thing about this approach is, particularly because this is your hurricane map, so you, you know, we think we're going to do this, but who knows? By the time we get there, you know, it, it might be Miami. <laughs> but, um, and it turns out, actually, they replace this one, and all of a sudden, bank comes into play. And you go, oh, my God. And then you have to do something about it. Um, but it gives you a chance to look ahead and sort of do things with probability rather than yes or no. Um, and I mean, t t just sort of guessing about the, 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 what you're saying about sort of the quality of the components is if you've got one of these, it doesn't matter how bad it is. It can stay red for the rest of its life or whatever color you choose as long as you never have to change it. Um, so if you fix it, what's the point? I guess the reason I bias towards the other one a little bit is just yeah. the sense that quite often we don't, there are many people in organizations that don't have a sense of the reality of the software. Yes. So yeah. you can have it read for a while and just go and say, hey, this is great because your portfolio of features yeah. never really impact that and they can just yeah. kind of see that kind of thing. Yeah. So it's just really, I guess, a matter of what we choose to show. Yeah. But and, and I think this is great. You know? Oh, good. And then the other thing is, is, again, talking about cost of delay rather than price you know, or whatever is, is not least if you can get the... If you get people to under, I mean, a lot of, like I said, a lot of organizations don't even understand that. If you get them to start talking those terms, um, things become a bit clearer. OK, I think we have one here. As, oh, sorry. Um, other than ad hoc, do you have any favorite ways of uh, producing this diagram? No. No, just ad hoc. And I think that's, actually, I think that's a good, and I, I think that's a good thing. Because, you know, th um, there's a whole school now of, you know, trying to price technical debt 
you know, there's, there's a, it's part of one of the IEEE conferences. And I speak entirely out of ignorance here, but it just makes me incredibly nervous. I think there are, there are probably indicators. That probably you could run simple metrics over your code base and say, well, this is why we think bank is 500 points, because we, look, we ran the report and look at this. Um, but it's 500 points in context. Um, and I, sus I can't, again, speaking out of ignorance, I suspect that very simple indicators would give you enough information. Or just to get, because of, often people, the team knows quite often. You know, that's just, a, we're just going to have to rewrite that. And you, you spend a half a day doing some index cards, and that's what it's going to cost to replace. Um, so I think, to me, it, it's like doing, it's like the index cards thing. It's, it's do that first before you start getting into, thing. And, unless you inherit code. I mean, there's, there's a whole thing about inheriting, you know, someone else's system, and then you have to maybe be a bit more structured. I thought there was okay. one over here somewhere. Oh, yeah, yeah. We have a few at the back as well. Uh, yeah, hi, thanks for the talk. It was good. This whole game map I like as well. I think my question was almost the same as my last one. Uh, I think my experience is it's hard to get the colors right and the estimates right. I think uh, we, we've struggled to get meaningful colors for the, the yeah. problems. So it, 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 also, it also depends a lot on context, whether you have stable teams or not, and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, it all depends. Send a consultant answer. <laughs> I think we might be done. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much.